thing we're going to cover in this course, which is statistics. And I call it a review of statistics because I suspect or I hope that uh, you all had some statistics in the past. But uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, cover statistics at a level that you may not actually have uh, have covered in the past. Or more importantly, what I also want to do is to not just cover the the kitchen recipe approach, approach to, to, uh, to statistics, which is what most people have, you know, do this, you know, plug in this, divide by that, whatever, but to actually give you a good understanding of why we're doing it, okay? What, 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 why are we doing, you know, uh, whatever statistical approaches we're doing? So I want you to understand that. And so, uh, so therefore, this, this, this chapter has quite a bit more mathematical content, actually, uh, than uh, at first glance than uh, any of the other chapters you've seen so far. However, I've taken very great pains to ensure that every single step in the derivation is completely logical and follows from the previous steps. There are no missing steps. Every single step is explained. And uh, if, you, if you stare at it long enough, you'll find that there's nothing missing. I have made very sure of that. Um, so, so uh, you know, anyway. So what are we going to do today? I'm going to start with the review expectations. When we covered probability, we kind of I just mentioned expectations briefly, but I'm going to go over in some more detail and we'll generalize that to moments. And this will allow us to go into what's called the moment generating function. The moment generating function is uh, one of the, exp uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, first, uh, you'll see this as a basically a transform domain technique. And the ideas used in moment generating functions show up in Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms, uh, Z transforms, and so on. And if I had more time, you know, this is, would be the entry into transform domain techniques and into control theory, but we don't have time for that. So I'm just going to do moment generating functions, some properties of that. This gives you a very powerful tool to study the normal distribution. So many of the statements are made about normal distribution without proof. In the probability chapter, I'm going to go back and prove it properly. And then, with any luck, I'm going to finish today with a complete proof of the central limit theorem, which is going to be great. It's one page, uh, and it's a complete proof. It's correct, and you need to know nothing beyond elementary algebra and elementary calculus to prove it, which is great. So I found this proof, and uh, I simplified it from the, from the textbook I found it in. And I think uh, at the end of this lecture, one o'clock, a little bit past one, you will be able to prove the central limit theorem and understand it, which is nice. I, I couldn't do it a while back, so I'm happy to share it with you. Okay, so no time to waste, got to keep moving. All right, so what's the expectation? So expectation is defined for discrete and continuous uh, random variables. So we know that the, if it's a discrete random variable, then the expectation of x is defined to be the sum over x of x px where p is the probability mass uh, function of x. So we just take each value x, multiply it with the probability, sum over all of these, and that's the expected value of x. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and for a continuous random variable, the expected value of x is correspondingly integral x uh, fx dx, where fx is the density function of x. And intuitively what we're doing is we're basically multiplying each value x with the probability of that particular value being chosen. And it's a similar kind of thing in the, uh, in the continuous sense. And this is just a standard definition of expectation that we already saw in probability. Another standard definition I'm going to just remind you of what is meant by expected value of a function of x. So expected value of gx, okay, which is a function of x, is for discrete variables is given by x, sum over x, gx, px, okay, where again px is the probability mass function, and for a continuous variable, it's the integral gx, fx, dx. Okay, where what we're doing is we're basically multiplying the function g with the density function value for that each value of x, and we integrate over all values of x, and that's just the you know, standard definition of the expected value of g of x and of x. Okay, so this is sort of a quick review. Okay, so far so good. Okay, this is definition. So just to show you how this works, because this thing is actually, even though it's easy to write, intuitively it's hard to understand. Okay, it's intuitively hard to understand. What does it mean to say I'm computing the expectation of a function of a random variable? And, uh, you know, I, 
I've written this down many times when I myself I find it hard to understand. And when you start talking about moment generating functions, you quickly realize that understanding the expectation of a function is not that easy, not that straightforward. You really have to think about it. And just to get that point across, I'm going to compute the expectation of x square, right? Expectation of x square where x is a uniform random variable. In 0, 1. So if you, if you have a uniform random variable in 0, 1, we know that basically fx equals 1, right? In the range 0, 1, fx equals, equals 1 because the area under the curve, obviously, from 0 to 1 is going to be 1. So if x is this, what is the expected value of x squared, right? What we're saying is basically if we have a random variable x, which is uniformly, uh, it's a uniform random, so we are defining a new random variable, which happens to be the square of this one. We're going to compute this, and it turns out to compute it, we just plug this in. We basically say this is going to be integral 0 to 1, x square, fx is 1, dx, which is x cubed by 3, evaluated at 0 and 1, which is 1 by 3. So that's the expected value of the square of a random variable. Okay? So the point is that you have to start thinking about not just random variables, but functions on random variables. So similarly, we can think about the expected value of an x cube or expected value of x to the n. Right? Just the same kind of thing. We're just applying different functions. And these have a name. And the name of this is moment, or more precisely, moment about the origin. OK, that's just the name it's given. And by definition, again, the rth moment about origin It's just nothing more than expected value of x to the r, and it's defined as mu r prime. That's the notation for that is just mu r prime. Okay. Again, what I'm doing is I'm just taking a random variable x. I'm not saying what distribution it's from. It's any distribution. And I'm computing the function x to the r and the expected value just as I did over here, and I define that to be the value of this. So for example, mu 1 prime equals expected value of x x to the 1, which is expected value of x. Well, and that's just the mean, which is denoted mu, right? And mu 2 prime is expected value of x squared. Well, we already saw that. Okay, just to use this notation at this point. Okay. Any questions about this so far? All right, so the next thing we're going to define is moment about the mean. And this is defined to be expected value of x minus mu to the r. Okay, so mu r is the rth moment about the mean. is the expected value of x minus mu to the r. Okay, so we take the random variable x, and it's from some distribution which has a mean value mu. So we compute the new random variable, which is x minus mu, and we take the rth power of that, the expected value of that is mu r. What is the expected value? Well, you can just plug it back in over here. Okay? If it's uh, discrete, then that just means x minus mu px, okay, x minus mu to the r px. So if it's continuous, x minus mu to the r fx dx. Okay? I'm not saying anything about what fx and px are. These are absolutely arbitrary. This is the definition of the moment okay, of, a, of any random variable. And so in particular, mu2 equals expected value of x minus mu squared. Okay? And what is that? <coughs> the variance. Okay, so the variance of a Random variable is just is just mu two. Okay. Uh, now we can now 
uh, relate mu2 and mu2 prime. Okay, so the moments about the mean and the moments about the origin are in fact related. So we remember that vx equals expected value of x squared minus x minus expected value of x the whole squared, right? And so we can write this one as this is mu two prime minus mu one prime square or the same as mu two prime minus mu square. Okay? Because this is just a simple expansion. What do we do over here? We just expand this expected value of x squared minus 2 mu x plus uh, mu square. Okay, and if you do this, it will turn out to be this expected value of x square minus 2 mu expected value of x plus mu square, right, which is expected value of x square minus mu square because expected value of x is mu again. So we get this, which is the same as what I wrote over here, which is the same thing over here, mu2 prime minus mu square. So it's a very simple proof. And in one of the exercises I've asked you to do is to find the relationship between mu3 prime and mu3. I've given the answer, but you know, you should try and prove it. Basically, just expand out x minus mu to the power 3, and you'll get a similar kind of relationship out of that. OK. So, so what have we done so far? Basically, gone over what expectation is and most importantly, expectation of a function of a random variable. And then we looked at the special class of functions, two, two classes of functions, those that are corresponding to the random variable raised to the rth power, and those that correspond to the random variable x from which you subtract mu, the mean, and take that to the rth power. And these two special functions are called the moments of a distribution, the moments around the origin and the moment about the mean. And the reason why the moment is important is because if I give you a distribution and I tell you the first, second, third, fourth, whatever moments, that is like a fingerprint of the distribution. So if I tell you the first moment is this, the second moment is this, the third moment is this, then I can actually identify pretty much what the distribution looks like. And uh, in particular, you know, the third moment is, is, gives you the skew of the distribution. So the, uh, I guess I'm running out of space here, but, uh, I should just add sort of third moment, which is expected value of x to the 3, is giving you basically how skewed it is. This is called a negatively skewed distribution. That would be a positively skewed, skewed distribution. So it's kind of bulging to the left or the right, corresponding uh, as compared to the normal. Okay, And the uh, fourth moment gives you what's called the kurtosis or the peakedness it, it's not exactly that there's a, there's a denominator which I'm leaving out but it gives you the kurtosis and it's a peakedness so this is the if this is the normal then something that's sharper than the normal like this this would be called a, a leptokurtic. And something that's flatter would be called a platykurtic. So something that's flatter than normal is like this. OK. And uh, <laughs> the uh, story goes that platykurtic is like a platypus, right? It's like a little platypus that's sitting over here with a flat back. And the leptokurtic is uh, thinner, and uh, you can fancy it as like two to two. This is from a guy called Student, as I mentioned. There's a brewer, right? So he had some fanciful imagery. There's a picture in this book, which I should probably get permission and copy. It shows two kangaroos with their long tails face to face. Okay, and there's a long tail. So they, the leptokurtic are two kangaroos, and they have long tails, which allows them to leap. Okay, so that's for lepping. So it's leptokurtic. <laughs> okay. So if you want to remember what leptokurtic is, just Im imagine two kangaroos face to face with long tails over here, and you know that's leptokurtic, and the platykurtic is like a platypus. I don't know, maybe it's Australian, <laughs> but uh, 
that's how you remember this. Anyway, that gives you the uh, e to, uh, x to the x to the four over here. Okay. So that's basically what we have so far is expectations and moments. And the point I was getting across is that if I tell you that the certain value of uh, you know, kurtosis and skew and so on and so forth of a distribution or you know, the moments are you know, these values, then I have a pretty good idea, a fingerprint of a distribution. And we'll actually use this fact a little bit later when we start talking about moment generating functions. Okay, because what a moment generating function does is to give you in one single expression all the moments. It's a full fingerprint of a uh, distribution. Okay. Any questions about this before, go, before I go on? Because if you don't understand this particular thing, e to the gx or e to the gx, then you have no hope for the rest of the class. You may as well go home. <laughs> okay. All right, so everybody's on board? OK, so yes, no? OK, all right, so this was the, the easy stuff. Now we're going to have some more fun uh, with okay, with the moment generating function. So the basis for all the transform domain techniques and the moment generating function is the fact that e to the x can be written as 1 plus x by 1 factorial plus x squared by 2 factorial plus x cubed by 3 factorial plus whatever. And you get this by just a simple Taylor expansion. You can take a Taylor series, expand it. You'll find that there is the notation for, x, for e to the x. Why is this nice? Okay, the two things that are nice about it. The first thing is, you're basically getting all the powers of x in the expression, x, x squared, x cubed, with some pretty straightforward, innocuous multiplications, yes, uh, constants multiplying them, you know, just factorials. It's not a big deal. The second thing is, on the left hand side, we have our nice e to the x, very easy to differentiate. Okay, if you have e to the x, Taking the nth power or nth uh, integral nth differential is straightforward. It's just e to the x. So what we have is on the left a very nice simple thing, and on the right something that is very powerful. Okay. So all transform domain techniques, you know, generally speaking, are essentially using e to the x. Okay, as a way to compress all the information about the powers of x. Okay. Now. In the moment generating function, what we're going to do is we want to ex get expectations of x, x squared, x cubed, and so on. We're going to get basically something that says e to the x and something like e to the x squared, etc. Right? So you think, aha, if I want to get that, how can I get all of it? Wait a minute, what I'll do is I'll take expected value of e to the x. If I do that, then I get all of these values over here. Now, in particular, what we do is we don't take just e to the x. Okay, so remember, the expected value of e to the x is, or I should probably put capital X because x is a random variable. Okay, this is just nothing more than a function of x. e to the x is like x squared or whatever, 2x something. It's just e to the x. It's just a standard function. So the expected value is just e to the x is a gx value, and you multiply the fx dx and so on. What we'll do is we define and this all transform domain techniques do this, we will introduce an auxiliary variable called t. Okay? t is so auxiliary variable. And we do this because we want, by controlling t, we can kind of tune what the expansion looks like. Okay? It gives us a knob in which to manipulate the uh, expression over here. So we define m of t, the moment generating function. Okay? And remember, there's no x in here anymore as defined to be the expected value of e to the power tx. Okay? So we have some random variable x. We define the function e to the power tx. Okay? Just like we define x squared, we can define this function. Right? It's just a function of random variable x, e to the tx. 
And then we can define the expected value of that because it showed you how to do that. Okay, this is just nothing more in the integral case, uh, in the continuous case for integral e to the t x f x d x, for example, and the discrete case similarly. All right. So that is the moment generating function. That's basically it. There's nothing more to that. It's just the expected value of e to the t x. Okay. So why is it useful? Why is it nice? Well, what we do is we, let's take this e to the e, expand e to the tx. So first we'll expand e to the tx as one plus tx plus t squared x squared by two factorial plus. Well, that's just a normal expansion. Let's take expectations from both sides because I can do that. So expectation is certainly a operator allows you to do this. E to the tx is one plus t expected value of x plus t square by 2 factorial expected value of x square plus and recognizing these as being the moments we get 1 plus t mu 1 prime plus t square by 2 factorial mu 2 prime plus and so on right so what we get is all of the moments in just one single number over here e to the tx how do we extract the moments? You've got the long series. To extract it, we use our knob, t. What do we do? We differentiate this. Okay, what happens when you differentiate it once? Okay, if you do d by dt of e, right? This term goes away, and then this term becomes mu 1 prime plus all these terms have t in them, something with t in them, right? And then what do I do? I set t to 0. If I set t to 0, this goes away. And then this one is just the same as mu 1. Right? So I take the MGF, differentiate 1 with respect to t, set t to 0, I'll get mu 1 prime out of it, which is, of course, equal to mu. If I differentiate twice, and set t to 0, I get mu 2 prime, because these terms will go away. This is a constant. First time I did, did, take the derivative first time, this goes away. Derivative second time, this goes away. And then you get basically you know, this term differentiated twice as the um, coefficient of mu 2 prime. And when I set t to 0, these terms have gone away because of differentiation. These terms go away because of t being set to 0 because all have t in it. The only thing left is this, so I can extract it out. So it's like a microscope. I can change the focus, right? I have the whole thing, and I change the focus by changing the derivative. As I increase the derivatives, all the unnecessary terms either drop off because of differentiation or drop off because t being set to 0, and I can focus on just the one term that I want, which is mu r prime. Okay, And that's why this works, and that's why I put in a T over here. This auxiliary variable is the focusing knob of the microscope. So it allows me to pick which term I want. And as I said, it all comes down to the fact that e to the hex x has this really nice expansion. You know, this is the this is the tail expansion. Okay. Any questions about this so far? Okay, I'm going to do one example and then we'll take a break. I can see everybody's still awake, so I'll take a example and show you the break. So let's take our uh, simple uh, old friend, uniform random variable. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the moments of the uniform random variable. So let's say that x is uniform in the range 0, 1 again. OK, so what is the MGF of x? It's nothing going to be, it's going to be expected value of e to the tx. It's just integral 0 to 1, e to the t, okay, uh, dx. Why? Because fx is 1, right? So e to the tx dx, because fx is 1. And this is nothing more than e to the t, okay, evaluated at, uh, sorry, uh, where did I put this? Okay, so e to, uh, 1 over t, e to the t. Because we have, we're going to be, okay, you need to have 1 over t as a factor over here. 1 over t, e to the t, evaluated at uh, 
tx evaluated at 0 and 1, and this is going to be 1 over t e to the t minus 1. Okay? But e to the t is this thing over here, 1 plus t by 2, 1 factorial, etc., etc. So if we subtract 1 from that, we get this whole thing, and if we divide by t, what we get is Okay, maybe I should just write it out equals 1 over t, uh, t plus t squared by 2 factorial plus t cubed by 3 factorial plus this, which is nothing more than 1 plus t by 2 factorial plus t squared by 3 factorial plus, basically it's t to the r by r plus 1 factorial plus, okay? That's just this. So that's the MGF. Okay, so now I can ask the question, what is mu1 prime? Mu equals mu1 prime. So I'm going to differentiate this once and set t to 0. Right? That's what I said, differentiate r times. When I differentiate it once, this goes away, right? And so the coefficient of t is over here is 1 over 2 factorial. The only thing that's left basically is 1 over 2 factorial, which is half. And all the other terms have higher powers of t. So they all go away as well. And so my focus becomes just this value over here. I can read it off. That's just 1 over 2. What about mu 2 prime? OK, so I'm going to di differentiate it twice. So I'm going to differentiate it twice. This term goes away, and this term goes away. And all the other terms go away as well. I only need to worry about this term over here. So the first derivative is going to be 2 over 3 factorial Okay, t, the first time I do it, and the second time I do it, it becomes just 2 over 3 factorial. That's the constant value, which is nothing more than 1 over 3. So this is equal to what? Expected value of x squared, and that was what I did earlier. When I, when I, computed, e to the, when I computed expected value of x squared, I used integral 0 to 1, x squared uh, dx, right, equals 1 over 3, you can see that these two values basically match. So it's the same thing, but now I'm doing it using a more powerful technique. Because in the earlier case, I had to basically evaluate x square dx, and do x cubed dx, x4 dx, etc., etc., right? Whereas here, from this expansion, I can just quickly read off these values, and you can easily show that the rth uh, moment of the uniform distribution is 1 over r plus 1. Okay, you can actually prove that, and that's a homework, uh, homework exercise uh, uh, for you to do that. Okay, so I should finally add that the NTF, as you can see, has got in it all of these terms, the mu to the, the mu r terms. Okay, sometimes the moments are infinite. Okay, the expected value of x to the 10, for example, of some distribution could be infinite. Okay, it doesn't have to be finite, in which case the MGF is undefined. And so to get around this, you can use something called the characteristic function, which uses e to the i tx rather than uh, tx. So you go into the complex domain, and then everything is bounded. But we don't need it for, for the central limit theorem. It's not something you need right now, so I'm not going to talk about it. But I just want to let you know that you know, that's what. So Laplace basically looks like that. You know, we go into the uh, complex domain. OK. Any questions about this so far? Okay, so let me take a break here, and then after the break, I'll talk about the uh, properties of the moment generating function, and that will allow us to kind of move forward. Um, so I'm going to talk now about the properties of the uh, moment generating function. All right, so I'm going to prove essentially two properties of the moment generating, generating function. One of them has to do with uh, the uh, MGF of the sum of two independent random variables, and the other one has to do with transformations in a random variable. So let's look at the first one. So let's say that the MGF of x is m1t, and MGF of y is m2t, and x and y are independent. Okay, so we can ask the question, can we compute the MGF of x plus y? 
Okay. And the answer is, yeah, it's quite easy. Okay, what is mg of x plus y? It's just the expected value of e to the power x plus y t, right, by definition. All right, so we just expand this out, it's the expected value of x t plus y t. And that's going to be expected value of e to the x t multiplied by expected value of e to the y t. Okay, why can, how can I do that, right? Maybe I should take one more step. It's equal to expected value of e to the x t, e to the y t, right? I'm going from the product of two things to the product of the expectations, and this is only true when x and y are independent. Okay, if x and y are independent, the product of two independent random variables is the product of the expectations. So the expectation of the product is the product of expectations when they're independent. Otherwise, we have to have a covariance term, which I'm not going to use here. So if x and y are independent, then I get this. But this is e to the x t, and this is the expected value of e to the y t. So this is nothing more than m1 t m2 t. So we've shown that the MGF of the sum of two independent random variables is the product of the NGFs, which is what I've shown over here. Okay? All right. So let's use this fact just to show you how this works. So let's say X is uniform in 0, 1, and Y is uniform 0, 1. Okay? I want to know what is the NGF of x plus y. Okay? So just now we saw that NGF m1t is going to be 1 over t e to the t minus 1. Right? That's what we showed just now. And m2t is the same. The same as this. So the NGF of x plus y is 1 over t square e to the t minus 1 squared because we put in product, take the product of two things, it's just a squared. Okay? Just to give you an idea of how to use this rule over here. Any questions about that? Okay, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> it looks straightforward. Wait until you go home and try the homework exercise, then you'll realize you know nothing. <laughs> you know nothing. Okay. So, all right. Let's do some another fun one. Let's say let's say MGF of X <coughs> is m one t, and y is defined to be a x plus b. So y is another random variable, and it's an affine transform of x, a x plus b. What is the MGF of y? Okay, well, we, uh, it's going to be expected value of e to the a x plus b t, right? And this is going to be what? Expected value of e to the a x t e to the b t, right? And this is going to be e to the b t expected value of e to the x, a, uh, sorry, a x t, which you can write as basically e to the b t m of m1 of um, a x, sorry, a t. Okay, because it's just the same, instead of using t as my knob now, I have to use a t as the knob. Okay, so it's the, it's exactly what, just by definition. I'm just kind of following the form. So, so we have proved that if y equals ax plus b, then mgf of y is e to the bt m1 at. Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> okay. So let's have some fun. So I know the expected value of x, right? I want to compute the expected value of let's say x minus mu. 
Okay? So what I'll do is this. I'm going to use the MGF of this, so it'll be M1T. So the MGF for x minus mu is just basically setting A to be 1 and B equals minus mu. Right? And so the MGF of this is going to be E to the minus mu T M1 T. Okay? So if I have, but remember that this x minus mu, I should probably not, okay, forget about this. Uh, this one basically generates x, x squared, and so on, x to the r, right? This one generates x minus mu, x minus mu squared, x minus mu to the r, and so on. Right? Those are the moments. But we recognize these as mu r prime, and recognize this as mu r. Okay, so the moments about the mean can be computed by essentially multiplying the MGF by e to the minus mu t. So if we just do this, we are able to generate all the moments around the mean. Okay, so we can take an MGF that generates uh, uh, mu, uh, mu 1 prime, or all the mu r prime over here, expectations of x, x squared, and so on. And we can just multiply the m1t by e to the minus mu t, and that gives you all the moments around the mean. In particular, we can get mu 2 simply by taking the m1t, multiplying the e to the minus mu t, differentiating it twice, and setting t to 0. Okay? So even though this looks simple, y explains the derivation is absolutely trivial. It gives you a one-step technique from going from the MGF around the origin to MGF around the means. And that means you can get all the moments around the means. If you can describe the moments around the origin, you'll get the moments around the means. OK, so let me do an example to show how to use that. So uh, remember that, uh, well, let's just do that. So, uh, let's compute the variance of a uniform random okay so remember that expected value of let's say x is uniform in 0 1 okay I, I write that as this x is a random variable that's uniform in 0 1 I can write that like that we already saw that expected value of x is half, and expected value of x squared, which is mu 2 prime, is 1 by 3. OK, what I want to compute is expected value of x minus mu squared, which is vx. What is that value? OK, it's not half or one third. What is it? All right? How are we going to do this? We're going to use that derivation on that board over there. OK, so how do we do that? Basically, we take e to the minus mu t, okay, m t, is going to be e to the minus mu t times 1 over t, e to the t minus 1. Right? That's the, that's the moment rating function for moments around the mean. Right? And this is going to be just e to the minus mu t by t, e to the t minus 1. OK? Now we're going to differentiate this twice and set t to 0. OK, just plug and chug. <laughs> Except it's not that easy. Except it's not that easy. So I did this, and I said, oh, that's easy. Let me go ahead and solve it. I spent about four hours <laughs> on it, uh, mostly because I'm pretty stupid. Also because I forgot all my derivatives, all my differentiation, I forgot that. I studied that when I was in high school, which was a long time ago. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's just chain rule, no big deal, right? Just apply chain rule and expand it out and set t to 0. Well, guess what? This is a pretty nasty thing to differentiate. 
Why? Because you have basically three terms, e to the minus mu 2, you have t e to the three minus 1. If you're going to use chain rule, well, just think about it. If you're going to use chain rule, this stuff you're going to keep constant, take the different derivative of this plus this. Hey, wait a minute, I have a t in the de denominator. <laughs> and I have t in the denominator, and I set t to 0, I get infinity. So what I have to do is I have to somehow get rid of t in the denominator. Okay? And so I tried all sorts of tricks. You know, I tried different manipulations. And then I sort of just gave up, and then I walked to work, and then, you know, the fresh air woke me up. And so I'll tell you the trick, because this is a trick you're going to have to use all the time if you're going to do anything with exponential stuff or anything with moment generating functions when you have a t in the denominator like this. And that trick is expand out both of these into infinite series and basically take the product of two infinite series. That sounds bizarre, but it really is very simple. Let's take just e to the minus mu t. That is 1 plus mu t plus mu t squared by 2 factorial plus and so on. And you're going to multiply that by e to the t minus 1 by t. Okay? We recall that's already what we saw, you know, that one we already did earlier. It's just uh, 1 plus t by 2 factorial plus t squared by 3 factorial plus and so on. Okay, so the t has gone away from the denominator. Okay, that's right away, it's gone. But I'm, I'm stuck with two infinite series and I have to take the product of two infinite series. This is where you have to be a little bit clever. What you say is like this. What am I going to do after I take the product of these two things? Well, I'm going to throw away all terms which are of t cube and higher powers. It just doesn't make any sense to me because I'm going to, deriv I'm going to de take derivative twice. If it's t cube, I'm going to have something with t in it and I said t to 0 is going to vanish. And also I can forget about all terms which have power less than t squared because those are going to vanish also. So all I really need to do is pick out from here those terms which are the coefficient of t squared times t squared. All right? And then I'm going to multi uh, take the derivative twice. What happens if I take the derivative twice? I just multiply this by 2 because that's the derivative of t squared is 2. So if I take coefficient of t squared, multiply it by 2, hey, that's my answer. Okay? So that's it. So what's the coefficient of t squared? You can just figure it out. The only way I can get t squared is like this. Okay? So I get 1 over 3 factorial plus. I get t squared by like this, which is mu over 2 factorial okay, plus 1 and this way, right? And that's just mu t square, so uh, mu square by 2 factorial. Okay? And, uh, oh sorry, I forgot this over here. This is going to be 1 minus mu t. Okay, so this is going to be minus mu by 2 factorial because uh, it's negative over here, right? And, uh, and so this one turns out to be uh, nothing more than, uh, well, 1 over uh, 3, 6 minus mu over 2 factorial is 1 over 4 plus mu squared is 1 over 4 over 2 plus 1 over 8, and this is going to be 1 over 12. <laughs> oh, my goodness, it looks like I'm not doing any magic here. This is, yeah, it's okay. I'm just picking out coefficients of t square, because that's all I care about. Yeah. How do, I, how do you know that the, the derivatives always exist? Oh, how do I know derivatives exist? It's because oh, you, oh. You, you need to have a continuous function to take yeah. the derivative. It's e to and the t. How do you know that this function is continuous around zero? Oh, okay. This one over here. Yeah. This one. Okay. Which, which you took the drop derivative. Yeah. Of. Yeah. I, I, I am. I'm, so first of all, it's true. It doesn't necessarily exist. Right? So it doesn't you exist. Can you, you cannot. You cannot. Because remember, the moment MGF is not defined for, for example, the Cauchy distribution has an infinite uh, first moment. Okay? There's something called the Cauchy distribution, which is infinite first moment. The mean is, or even the power, power law, okay? you can have infinite uh, uh, mean for power law. Right? So uh, then you can, you can go through this, but it, the results are meaningless. Okay? So here I have not gone through the 
process of satisfying myself that it's actually continuous. So and the, how do we know that this 1 over 12 is meaningful? Well, I know for the, well, over here, what I really should be doing is basically validating that this is continuous at 0. I have to look at the left and right derivatives at 0, show that they match, right? But this is a very simple function. It's actually pretty trivial, as you can see. It's just, you know, it's not a big deal to show that. Because if I take this, it will. Actually, since the, actually, since the calculation of the derivative is a big deal, for sure the proof of the continuity is a big deal. Uh, the calcula calculation of the full derivative is. Is uh, can be problematic if you don't if you don't do it the right way. Okay, um, okay. so let me uh, step back here and say that uh, when dealing with most nice functions, which is what you'll typically be dealing with, you know, normal, uniform things like that, you uh, somebody has has done the dirty work of ensuring that it's uh, that meets the criteria that it, it's essentially the the, the continuity is is met. Okay, it's mathematically nice. Okay. You're not going to see big surprises in these ones. But if you go into sort of uh, unknown functions, then you have to go through step by step and make sure that what you're doing is correct. What I was showing over here was just showing you that naively following this rule of derivative twice, of taking the de derivative twice, is not going to work. You do have to first eliminate t from the denominator. Otherwise, when you take the derivative, it's not going to work. Okay, so you have to do this this thing over here. By the way, I need to multiply this by two. Anyway, but the answer will come out to be one by twelve. So I can put that back over here equals one over twelve. So all this I want doing to give you to to, to you know have two goals in mind. The first goal is to uh, give you some amount of facility, some amount of thinking about what does it mean, what does the MGF mean? Okay, so that's what I'm going through in some detail. The second thing, you know, is to uh, show the how to deal with this uh, T in the denominator. Okay, so just, all right. Any questions about this so far? Okay, so I'm going to uh, go into the normal distribution and show a few things with the normal distribution. We'll take a break and then the grand finale is the central limit theorem. Okay, all right. So let's just do a normal uh, distribution because it's it's easy to. So it's really easy when you have the NGF. So what's the normal? Well, a variate is normal if f x equals one upon sigma under root two pi e to the minus half x minus mu by sigma squared. Okay, that's a normal variant, and uh, and that's that's just it. that's all the thing it is. Why do we need sigma root two pi? That's just a normalization con coefficient, and we we saw this earlier. So let's compute m of t. What's the moment generating function of the normal? Okay, it looks complex. It's like ah, oh, how am I going to do it? It can be done in just one line. It's a long line, but it's a single line. It's just expected value. It's the expected value of e to the power t x, so t over sigma root 2 pi. OK, e, uh, uh, wait a second. How am I going to do this? Uh, yeah. OK, let me just do this properly. It's expected value of e to the t x, OK? And the expected value of e to the t x is what? We're going to take e to the t, uh, and multiply that by fx. So it's going to be, uh, let me just make sure I'm going to write over here. It's uh, 1 over uh, sigma root 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity. So I'm going to put essentially fx, uh, 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 tx fx, okay, e to the tx fx, it's going to be e to the let me just write this down, explain it in a second. e to the tx minus half x minus mu the sigma square dx. Okay? So, how did I get that, right? Remember that expected value of g of x is integral minus infinity to infinity uh, gx fx dx. That's the first thing I wrote. Right? So 
Okay? So it's minus infinity to infinity. What's fx? 1 upon sigma root 2 pi e to the minus half x minus mu by sigma square, right? And I'm going to multiply it by gx. What is gx? It's e to the power tx, right? So I take, when I multiply the two, the exponentials get added. So m of t is just e to the tx minus this. So it looks like magic, but all I'm doing is just following this rule over here, that e of gx is gx fx dx. Okay, so this is gx fx dx. It's not e to the power tx raised to the power whatever the heck it is, right? It's not that. It's just the product of gx and fx which is what I'm doing over here. Okay, so the line is long, so I'll just, what I'm going to do is, what I want to do really is to think about it, is somehow I want to make this look like a normal distribution, and then if it does, this 1 upon sigma root 2 pi will kind of cancel out with that because the area under the curve is 1. Okay, I want to make it look like a square, basically. Something looks like a square. So it's called completing the square. What I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply and divide by a particular term, carefully chosen term. And when I do that, you'll find that it becomes a square. So what I'm going to do is, and let me just write it down first. So it's e to the mu t plus half uh, sigma square t square over sigma, sorry, sigma under root 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity e to the minus half x minus mu minus sigma square So what I've done is I'm adding and subtracting e to the mu t plus sigma square t square, okay? Or I'm multiplying and dividing by e to the power mu t plus sigma square t square, okay? So here I'm multiplying, and here I have a negative sign, so I'm dividing. It turns out that if you take this and you add to it mu t plus half sigma square, half sigma square t square, that becomes, and you already have tx over here, that becomes this square over here, okay? So all you need to do essentially is to take this, expand it out, okay? And you expand it out, you'll get these terms in the negative sign plus these terms, the x minus mu squared and the tx term. All right? So if you do that, you'll get that. All right? So then what you do is you say, okay, wait a minute. This thing over here in this big oval, this thing in the oval, what is that? Well, it's a normal variant, okay, which has uh, the mean as mu minus sigma squared t squared, whatever that is, because t is a constant, as far as we are concerned, and uh, a variance of sigma, so this value equals 1. That's the area under a normal curve, right? So this is nothing more than e to the power mu t plus half sigma square t square. Okay? So it's only one line. So let me just quickly go <laughs> this because I see a stunned look on people's faces, like what happened here? Okay, I have fx as this. That's just the Gaussian distribution. I want to compute the expected value of e to the tx. I go back to first principles and say that expected value of g of x is just gx fx dx. So e to the tx is the function. So I plug it in, e to the tx minus this. I'm going to multiply that by fx, which is this, so tx. So gx, fx, you get those two right here. This is uh, gx, that's fx, multiply the two, I get this. Okay, nothing complicated here. Now I'm going to use a clever trick which is called completing the square, which is I'm going to make this look like a square. I'm going to make it look like half something square, okay? Half something square means it looks like a normal distribution. So what terms do I need to add? I need to add the terms, in this case, multiply by mu t plus half sigma square t square. And then this whole thing vanishes because it's just one, and then left with this, and this becomes the empty. Okay, I would, you know, you should go back and review this if you want to, but uh, that's basically it, right? So if I know that this is the NGF of the normal, then I want to, I can use it to proving some simple theorems about the normal. For example, I want to show that if X is distributed normally, 
with some value mu and some variance sigma square. I want to uh, compute the, uh, uh, MG, uh, the MGF of AX plus B. Okay, what is the MGF of AX plus B? Right, same, same kind of deal I was trying to do earlier. So I, I was doing earlier, I was just showing you, you know, uh, what to do, but let's use this to uh, look at the MGF AX plus B. Well, this is going to be uh, uh, e to the a t m of b t. Sorry, e to the okay. Um, uh, I got the terms. It, it, let me just use whatever in the notes because I was doing a plus b x over there. Uh, so a plus b x. So uh, the MGF is going to be uh, e to the a t. That's the constant part, m of b t. Okay. That's the multiplication of the x. This is going to be uh, uh, e to the a t, uh, e to the mu b t, which is mu b t plus half sigma square b square t square. Okay. And now I can just rearrange terms. It's going to be e to the power a plus b mu t plus half sigma square b t square. Okay. Uh, actually, I want to do it differently. Let's just call it sigma square b square. Sorry, sigma square b square t square. Okay, so now what we do is we basically compare this expression and this expression over here. Okay, remember that this is the fingerprint of the normal, and this is the fingerprint of some distribution. We don't know what it is, right? And we're comparing fingerprints. We're saying, okay, if the fingerprints match, that must be the criminal, okay? So the fingerprints match by setting, if you take A plus B mu to be mu prime, Okay, not mu prime, let's use something else. Let's say nu. This is basically e to the nu t plus plus half, okay, whatever, uh, uh, nu, uh, sigma square nu square, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of terminology. Let's just rho square t square. Okay, where nu equals a plus b mu, and rho equals uh, b sigma. Okay, if I look at this one over here, somebody comes and tells you, here I have a MGF that looks like e to the nu t plus half rho squared t squared. You say, oh yeah, that's normal. That's a normal distribution which has a mean of nu, and it has a variance of rho. Right, because that's exactly what I said over here. It's mu t plus half sigma square t square. So this has a mean of mu and a variance of sigma square. So comparing over here, there is a normal with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma of rho square. But I just substituted mu equals a plus b mu. So this is nothing more than a normal, which is a plus b mu, and the variance is b square sigma square. And if you compare this with this, we find that if x is normally distributed with nu sigma square, then a plus bx is normally distributed with a plus b mu and b square sigma square. Okay, I just proved that over there. Okay. Any questions about that? So what I'm showing over here is the use of a moment generating function to uh, as a fingerprint, as a fingerprint of a distribution, and then you can compare in the moment generation function, you can compare moment generation functions and work backwards and see what the distributions look like, okay? So that's what I showed over here. So uh, given this is normal, I now shown a plus bx is normal, okay? And so we can use this for another little trick, and a useful trick at that.
So we say that, let's say that x is distributed normally with uh, mu sigma square. Then how about we compute a plus bx, where a equals uh, uh, right, okay. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to transform. Okay, let me just show this. I want to basically go from n mu sigma square to n zero one. Okay. So first of all, let's think what n zero one means. So n zero one is a normal with a zero mu, uh, mu uh, mean and a variance of one. Okay, it's called the standard normal variate. Okay, and so all the uh, tables that you find for normal distribution uh, are, are on the standard normal variate. Okay, so what you can find, and I'll leave this as exercise, is that you take x minus mu by sigma, okay, which is nothing more than 1 over sigma x minus mu over sigma, okay? If you take, so this is basically your, I said I was using a plus bx, so this is, uh, so this is b and this is a, okay? So a is minus mu over sigma and b is 1 over sigma. If you take this, okay, the, then any variant x, which is normal mu sigma square, can be transformed into this variant, 1 over x, 1 over sigma x minus mu over sigma, okay, or basically taking x minus mu over sigma, and this will be n01. Why is it going to be n01? Well, we basically, is, we take a plus b mu and b square uh, sigma square, okay? So what is b square sigma square? Well, it's 1 over sigma square sigma square. It's just 1. Okay, what about a plus b mu? Well, if you do the math, you'll see right away that a plus b mu is going to be zero. Okay, so uh, mu or sigma plus uh, minus mu or sigma plus mu or sigma is a plus b mu. That's zero, right? So you can see right away that x minus mu or sigma is n zero one. Okay, it's just a trivial proof. Okay, so what I've shown over here is that if any variant is normal, I can transform it by using this transformation into a variant that is. Uh, zero, 01 and this is called the standard term z. So z represents a standard normal variant. Again, you can see that the proof of this with moment generating functions is absolutely trivial. Okay, I mean once you that that proof is uh, is just matching terms, and then this one you just plug in a and b, and all you need to do is elementary algebra, and you can prove this, which in the regular domain, not in the transform domain, the regular domain is complex. You know, you have to go one over sigma root two pi da 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 da, expand it all out. Here you just say, yeah, sure, I guess match it up, and there you go. It's really simple. That shows you an example of the power of working in the transform domain. Okay, let me do one more uh, thing about the normal, and then uh, we can st uh, then we can take a break. So let's say that x is normal uh, with uh, mu 1, sigma 1 square, and y is also normal with mu 2, sigma 2 square. So these are two normal variates, uh, and they're independent. Again, we want to look at the, we want to look at what is x plus y? Is it normal? Is it not normal? You know, what is it, right? So what we do over here is to use moment generating functions. Okay, so we'll say, okay, let's say that x is m one t, okay, and this is going to be m two t. What we know is that x plus y is going to have moment generating function of m one t, m two t, because we just showed as a property of the moment generating function that the sum of two independent random variables results in the product. The, you know the 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 uh, MGF of the sum is the product of the individual MGFs. All right. So okay. So we know what m one t is. This is going to be e to the power uh, mu one t plus half sigma one square t square. And this is going to be e to the mu two t plus half sigma two square t square. And just gathering terms is going to be e to the power mu1 t, mu1 plus mu2 t half 
sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square t square. Just gathering terms. Here's the fingerprint of the culprit. <laughs> OK, this one over here. Compare it with this. What, can we, what conclusion can we draw? Sorry? Normal. It's normal. What does it mean? It's mean is the sum, and the, standard, and the variance is also the sum. OK, and you can see you can expand this quite easily to prove the following theorem, which is that, OK, sum of independent normal variates is normal with uh, mean equals sum of the means and variance equals sum of the variances. That's just a trivial extension. Again, this proof in the kind of the regular domain, okay, is, is hard or not obvious, whereas in the transform domain, it just means, yeah, the exponential, you know, the multiplication of two exponentials is the sum of the exponents. That's what you really need to show over here, and you immediately get the proof over here, which is, which is cute. Okay. <laughs> you have to admit this is cute. <laughs> okay. so, so hopefully by this time you're convinced that the MGF is, is useful. Uh, so let's take a short break, and then after that I'll use uh, the properties of the MGF to actually prove the central limit theorem. Okay, so, okay, so we will definitely run over. Does anybody need to leave at one? It looks, but... <laughs> 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 okay, so, all right, so what is the central limit theorem? The central limit theorem is this theorem about essentially sums of random variables. And to be more precise, sums of independent random variables. Okay, so what we have is this. I'm going to give you a bunch of random variables in x1, x2, x3, etc., etc. I'm going to sum them up, and what I want to do is to basically figure out uh, what is the uh, distribution of the sum. Okay, that's all they have to do. I have so I have x1. I'm going to use superscript because I'm going to use superscript for something else. So I have x1, x2, x3, xn. So I have n random variables, and then I compute sigma xi. And I'm going to find out, OK, how is it distributed? right? And the central limit theorem says that if no matter what x is drawn from, okay, almost, I should say, almost independent of the values of x, the sum, or the distribution of x, the sum of this as n tends to infinity, OK, is going to be normal, OK, with, in fact, the sum of the uh, some of the uh, means and the variance be some of the sigma i square. Okay, so I'm just saying that it's great. You know, I, I have this, uh, this could be Poisson variates, this could be exponential variates, this could be whatever. I just pick up, as long as they're independent and they add them up, okay, the sum is going to behave as if it's a normal, okay? Which means that, you know, if I divide by n, it's also going to behave like it's normal, which means that their mean is also going to behave like it's normal. Okay? Why is this important? This is very important because essentially all of statistics is based on this. Okay? All of statistics is based on this because I can, when I sample something, okay, I'm, let's say I'm computing uh, the packet size on the link. Okay? I pick up the first packet, the packet size is 200 bytes, the next packet is something else. Okay? And I'm going to compute the mean packet size, which is basically taking the sum of the packet sizes and divide by total number of packets. So I have a sum coming in. Okay? As long as these packets are chosen in some random fashion, that mean is going to behave like it's a normal. Okay? That's really what the central limit theorem is saying, which means that suddenly I can start looking at the mean and talk about how much variability is there going to be in the mean. Okay? Because that is nothing more than this. The amount of variability is just sort of the variability in the individual things, okay? So as long as I'm doing random sampling, so as long as, and the samples are independent, I can claim they're independent, I can now have a handle on a statistic of that sample, which is called the mean, okay? So we'll come to all of that next class, but today I'm going to focus on just showing that this is true, okay? 
And, uh, and so the, uh, just to finish the thought, what we're therefore assuming is that each time we pick a sample okay, and measure something, those are independent. That's the only assumption I'm going to make. All right, and I just pick up something, I measure it, pick up something, I measure it, and uh, you know, if I do enough of those, the sum of them, not individually each one, but the sum of them is going to look like a normal. Okay, so I'm going to prove that. Okay, so how do we set it up? Let me just write down the notation uh, just a little bit. Uh, we'll say that we have basically y is going to be x1 plus, I'm using superscript as I said, plus xn. Okay, all right. Now we know they're independent, so we know that. Uh, let, and let's say this has a value of mean of mu. This has a uh, mean of mu one, mu two, and mu n. In fact, I don't even require that these are in the same distribution. They can even be, you know, arbitrary distributions. I don't really actually uh, care over here. And similarly, I'm going to say this is sigma. This is sigma one square, sigma two square and up to sigma n squared. Those are the means and variances. And I know right away that, well, mu equals sigma mu i. I know that because that's just, you know, y is the sum. Even if, you know, this is just expectation, I'm just summing it up. And because they're independent, sigma square equals sigma i square. Okay, this is only because they're independent. If they're not independent, I couldn't, I couldn't take the uh, uh, sum in this way, but they're independent, so I can do that. Okay? So, all right, so now I'm going to use MGFs, right? So let me denote the random variable xi has a MGF, arrow means has MGF, has M, uh, what am I using? Okay, M sub i t, okay? So why is the sum of independent random variables? Because they're independent, we know that y has the MGF, just the product of the m sub i t. Because they're independent. We just showed earlier that the uh, MGF of the sum of two independent variables is the product of the empty MGS, so this is the product. Okay? All right. So now I'm going to define a, a slightly different uh, 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 variant, and uh, I'm going to define w i equals x i minus mu. Because I want to get moments around the uh, moments around the uh, uh, mean rather than moments around the origin, so I'll have an auxiliary variable w i, which is defined just as this. You know that clearly has this, and then I'll define that this has the MGF of n i t. Okay, and which is going to be equal to e to the minus mu m i t. That we showed earlier that if you have this, you know, the uh, moments around the mean we get by moments around the origin multiplied by e to the minus mu. Okay, that's just, that's just straightforward. So now we'll take one more step, which is I want to compute sort of the standard variate. I want to compute the standard variate, which is going to be y minus uh, sigma, uh, sorry, y minus mu by sigma, okay? So maybe I should just say that uh, uh, let me just do this one more step. So the, uh, because w i is x i minus mu, right, y equals x sigma x i, so y minus uh, mu equals sigma x i minus mu 1 minus mu 2, or mu 1 plus, plus mu 3 plus, right? I'm just expanding out y and mu, because I know mu is sigma mu y over here. And so I can just rearrange terms to be basically sigma x i minus mu i, right? So y minus mu is this, okay? Which means that the MGF of y minus mu, the MGF of y minus mu is going to be the product of the MGFs of the x i minus mu uh, uh, product of the I should just write n g f of x i minus mu i. But wait a minute! I just saw that if w has the form w i is this, then this is going to be 
nothing more than product of the Wi's, T. Okay, which is of course going to be um, uh, okay. I'll just leave it there, I guess. Or yeah, let me just leave it there for now because I don't need the I don't need to expand. I, I know what Wit is also in terms of Mi, but let's not worry about that for now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. It is xi minus mu i. Yeah, we're looking at the individual. Each of these has their own mu i. Yeah. And they're expanding it out of it. Sorry. OK. Um, so next, we'll take one more step. Instead of going y minus mu, I'm going to now go y minus mu over sigma. OK. OK, y minus mu over sigma is going to, uh, therefore, uh, what, what, we, what are we doing over here? Basically, we are uh, multiplying y by the, uh, dividing y by sigma, okay? So if you, look, if you remember the formula for a plus, uh, a plus bx, we're just going to take the bt term over here. So we just have to worry about this term, and then we have that mu coming in over there, right? So this is going to be uh, having the mgf uh, uh, of uh, n star, I'm going to call it as n star t, and this is defined by product of uh, i equals 1 to n of n sub i t over sigma. OK? So I'm just kind of going step by step. And so what I've shown essentially is that, well, I haven't shown anything yet. All I'm just showing, all I'm saying is that the uh, this, the variate, which is y minus mu or sigma, which is the variate for the sum, okay, has this MGF, product of the n sub pi t the sigma, where n is defined as this, e to minus mu m sub pi, okay? So now, what I'm going to do is just let's look at one of these guys over here. Let's just look at just one of them, not the product, but just n sub i t over sigma, and you know, look at what it is. Okay. Well, this one is the expected value of e to the power uh, uh, w i t per sigma because n sub i is the MGF of w, right? So I can just plug in the definition of n, and I get this over here. OK. <laughs> okay who, who's lost at this point? Or, OK, let me, uh, let me just backtrack over here. What I'm going to do is basically I want to compute the MGF of the sum. OK, that's what I'm going to try and get to. OK, I'm going to compute not just the MGF of the sum. I'm going to actually compute the MGF of a sum that is become transformed into standard normal variate, which means y minus mu over sigma. Okay, that's what I really want to get at. Okay, so all this stuff is basically trying to get to y minus mu or sigma. So what I have is I only know the MGFs of the uh, in individual x sub i's. Okay, there's MIT, and somehow I'm going to kind of use my theorems about MGFs to compute the MGF of y minus mu over sigma. That's really what's going on. All right. So the first step is I want to know what mu and sigma are for y. Luckily, that pops out right away. I don't need to do any work for that. It's just straightforward. I get that purely by definition of independence. So I don't need to do any work for that. So at least I know what capital, oh, sorry, I know what mu and sigma are, sigma squared are from mu y and sigma i squared. So that's easy. So now all this stuff over here is really to get to the stage where I can write down the MGF of y minus mu or sigma in the form of the product of these underlying n sub i, uh, n sub i over here, t over sigma, which I'm going to basically derive from the uh, from the x. So I, when I have x, okay, from here I can go to n, okay, and from n I can go basically to here, and from here I can work into y minus sigma minus rho, and that gives me the uh, MGF of y that I wanted in the first place. Okay, that's sort of the logic of what's going on. So I'm, I, I know what I want to get. I want to get something that tells me about what does y look like. In fact, I want to show, and I'll tell you the punchline already, I want to show that y is of the form e to the 
uh, minus uh, half, you know, sorry, e to the, uh, what is, <laughs> I want to actually show e to the uh, minus half t square, okay, because that's a standard normal variate. Actually, it should not minus, it's half t square. Okay, standard, so I want to show that the MGF of y looks like e to the half t square somehow. Okay, that's what I want to, so I'm working from the backwards. If I can show that the NGF of y looks like e to the half t square, I basically proved the central limit theorem because I've shown that the standard normal variate corresponding to the sum is a Gaussian. Yes? Is this y or y minus mu or sigma? Y minus mu or sigma, right? So I want to show y minus mu or sigma. That's why I'm going to y minus mu or sigma, okay? But that's fine. If y minus mu or sigma is e to the half t square, then y is basically what I said earlier. It will be uh, mu sigma square, right? So I just need to show that. Okay. Does that make sense? Sort of? <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm convinced that you'll not understand it right away. I'm just going to kind of give you some trail markers and you really have to go and read it very, very carefully because it's, it's not, it's not trivial. Okay. So, but the, you have to keep the high order bits in mind. The high order bit is somehow I'm going to, take all the mi's, convert them into ni's, just subtracting mu, and then I'm going to kind of compute the uh, uh, MGF of y as a product form, and then I'm going to simplify this and show that this particular variate has to form e to the half t square. That's sort of the game plan of how we're going to do this. So what we do, so I've got to here and have a product of a bunch of things, and I don't know what they look like, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick just one out, which is this one over here, and I write it out, and it's, in, 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 it's over here. And then this one, I can just expand out as expected value of just expanding e to the as one plus uh, uh, wi t by sigma plus wi square t square by sigma square plus. Okay, that's just I'm expanding out this e to the power w i t by sigma, I just take w i t by sigma, you know, the, uh, that's just what I'm doing over here, and I can write this as 1 plus expected value of w i uh, t over sigma plus expected value of w i square t squared by sigma squared plus, and you know, like any nice MGF, it has terms corresponding to the uh, the mean and so on and so forth over here, right? Yeah. Why, why are you omitting the, the factorial components? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that. I, it's my mistake. I am too eager to. There's two factorial and there's a, there's a two factorial. Sorry, you're right. The factorial components are there. Okay. Now, let's look at this a little bit, and you'll see one thing, which is what about what is the expected value of w sub i, the sub i, right? So the, remember, this is nothing more than expected value of x i minus mu i, but that's going to be expected value of x i minus mu i, and that's going to be zero, because expected value of x i is mu i, right? So this term goes away, all right? Let's look at the other terms over here. Basically, the lowest term which in the denominator, sorry, the term with the lowest value in the denominator is sigma square. After that, you get sigma cube, you get sigma to the four, etc. But what is sigma anyway? Sigma is the sum of the individual variations, all right? So if I add more and more terms, I'm going to get larger and larger and larger sigmas. Basically, if I take more and more samples, I'm going to add more and more variability. Okay, each of them is contributing its own variance to this. So sigma square for n large, is very large. And sigma cube is even larger, and sigma to the four is even larger. So approximately, I can do, what I can do is I can ignore all of these terms as well. Okay, and this is a very important proof technique in math. When you see these kinds of theorems, large n, basically what you're saying in large n is, let's find an expansion where I'm going to have these terms in the denominator I can get rid of. Okay, anything that says, okay, higher order pass, let's get rid of it because I don't want it. Okay, so your standard tool thing, toolkit is use the Taylor series, expand it out, and then ignore higher order terms. So I'm going to ignore the higher order terms, and I'm basically left with one plus this. There's nothing more than one plus expected value of wi square 
over uh, two uh, or t square by two sigma square. Okay, that's approximately equal to this. That is the value of one of these guys over here. This is going to be approximately equal to that. Okay. Now we can use one more. Uh, okay. So. Uh, uh, all right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to basically uh, go back over here when I said n i t is this, and let me just take the log of both sides. Okay. What I'm going to try and do is to try and kind of get rid of the product somehow. I'll just do the uh, the log. So log or natural log n l n or log of n star t is nothing more than the sum of the logs of the n sub i t by sigma, right? But I just computed that over there, okay, as being that one over there. So there's going to be nothing more than sigma ln of 1 plus, okay, expected value of, sorry, expected value of wi square t square by 2 sigma square. Okay? Yeah? So uh, those terms that go away as sigma, uh, you're basically the power of sigma grows. Yes. Have to, uh, sigma has to be greater than 1. Sigma has to be greater than 1. Why, why is that? Well, because remember, sigma is the variance in the thing. As n grows, it's just an additive thing. Right? As n grows larger and larger, we're just adding more and more of the sigma sub i's. Okay? So it's, it's not bounded in any fashion. It's just going to keep growing. The more variables you add to the uh, n, okay, the larger sigma square grows. Okay. okay. I mean, it's not clear that why it, has to, why it, it, it must be greater than Well, okay. Actually, I can prove that easily. <coughs> Remember that the sigma i squared, the variance is always positive, right? Because the expected value of the square of the deviations. So it's always positive, right? If it's always positive, it must be the case that if I take a large enough number of them, it's greater than 1. Okay. I mean, I'm allowing n to be infinite, right? If n is large enough, the sum of positive quantities must exceed any known number by definition of infinity, okay. right? So it has to be the case that for n large enough, I exceed 1, because we can exceed any number, actually, by definition. It's a limiting argument. Okay. Okay. Now you're saying, okay, in a small sample case, only at three samples or two samples, then I can't have, you know, then sigma may not be larger than 1. True. If the, if the number of samples, n, uh, number of values in the sample is less than, uh, is small, then it's not going to hold. So n has to be large, okay, for this to work. So I'm taking a limiting argument over here. Okay? okay. Yeah. But if you sum like a geometric series from one half, one fourth. Yeah. Basically, if you sum them to infinity, you won't even exceed one. No, no, but yeah, yeah, I agree. But that means that you're choosing these random variables x sub i in this very funny way, where the first one is a large variance, the second is a smaller variance, the third is a Okay. We're not doing something fine. If you do something pathological, it's not going to work. We're saying that, okay, in, in fact, one assumption that we, we, we don't have to make, but it typically happens in common practice, okay, is that, uh, in fact, all the sigma i squares are the same. Okay. In fact, you're drawing the elements all from the same underlying population. Okay. If you're drawing the same underlying population, then you won't get uh, a, a, a convergence series. You want a divergent series over here. Right? You want to make sure this is divergent because you want to exceed 1. Okay. And uh, I'm kind of skipping that bit of machinery over here, but you know, that clearly has to be the case for this to work. Okay. okay, so back to this over here. It has sum of ln 1 plus something. I'm going to use another trick over here, which is that uh, I can take the Taylor expansion of 1 plus h. Actually, it's basically, ln 1 plus h for h small approximately equal to h. Okay, it's very easy to prove. Okay, it's really just take the expansion, just pops right out. So, which means I can get rid of the 1 plus, 
Okay, so all I need to do is to, is to, is to over this one, this simplifies to sigma ln uh, uh, wi square, expected value of wi square over uh, t square over 2 sigma square. Okay? All right. Now, what is the expected value of wi square? Right? That's just sigma i square. Right? t square over 2 sigma square. But this is nothing more <laughs> than sigma square. I just wrote that over here a long time ago. So this is nothing but half t square. <laughs> sorry? Oh, sorry, Ellen. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, sigma ln over here, so sigma ln. Okay, but the whole thing is in a log. Maybe I should, let me just rewrite that. It's over here. See, sigma ln ni. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I doing? Yeah, I take it back. Eek. Okay, I'm being too. Okay, that, here you go. Yeah. Okay, this is going to be sigma uh, uh, sigma i square by t square by two sigma square. It is going to be. There's no ln. You're right. It's just um, half t square. The ln is on the left-hand side, actually. ln n star t is half t squared. So n star t equals e to the half t squared, which means it's normal 0, 1, which implies y is normal mu sigma squared. Yeah. yeah. Yes, because I have sigma in the denominator. Sigma is a divergent series. <laughs> okay? So it's like pulling a rabbit out of a hat, like, oh, yeah, sure, it works. Yes? Wasn't it easier to prove by induction instead of going through all these hassles? No. 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 In fact, why don't you do a homework exercise, proof by induction, and I will compare it with this. Because it's already past one. I'm not going to argue with you about that. Is it easier or not? It's not easier, because I didn't do it that way. <laughs> OK. So look, I wanted to get y to look like, uh, I should say the standard variable for y to look like a half t square. And at the end of all this, I in fact get half t square. OK. So what do you have to remember about the proof? There are two steps you need to remember. The first step is that you are going to take y, which is the thing you want to discover what it looks like, this one. And you're going to express it or express its NGF as the NGF of the ones that you do know about, the x sub i. OK, so that's what all this stuff is all about. I was basically getting the standard variate for y. I was going to express it in terms of the ni. OK, that's the first part. OK, somehow I can get from here to here. Second part, take this. Expand it out. First, we take logs to get rid of the product. Then each term we expand out using the exponential series. And then we take expectations. And that allows us to simplify down to half t square. And then I can plug that back over here and say, aha, my variant, therefore, is going to be this, which means that my sum is going to be normal mu sigma square. And what is this? This is just sum of the xi. So as long as n is large enough that I can sum the variances to a divergent value, so I can get rid of the expectations in the MGF of the sum, and also I can get rid of the 1 plus h over here, as long as I just have to do that and I have independence. Okay? That's all I have to have. I don't really care about the underlying distributions of the, NC, uh, of the NI. The NI distributions actually all go away. That's the beautiful part over here, right? It all goes in. The only, only way that N come in is over here as expectation of uh, WA square. But that goes away because of independence. We get just this one. The, the, the sigma 
i squared just cancel off the sigma squared because of sigma being sigma uh, of some of the sigma i. Okay, so these are the two steps. So first step, express what you want in terms of the MGFs. Second step, simplify the MGF and work backwards, and you find that uh, a y is normal n mu sigma square, and that is the central limit theorem. <laughs> okay, and as I said, uh, uh, it's it's a very pretty proof. I mean, there's there, there's nothing much here. That, that you need to, that you cannot do with just elementary algebra. The only thing that I've used over here, uh, which is not elementary algebra, is uh, expansion of e to the x, and this fact that log 1 plus h for small h is h, and that is, again, just trivial. So if you know expansion for e to the x and Taylor series, you get this, and you have essentially everything you need for proving the central limit theorem, and uh, which is, of course, one of the most uh, foundational uh, theorems in all of math. You know, I mean, in probability, this is the only two important theorems, central limit theorem and law of large numbers. And what you've seen over here is a complete uh, proof of large, uh, central limit theorem. And in fact, in the notes, I've proved the whole thing in one page. And, <laughs> and everything, I think, is, is correct and uh, uh, self-contained. So I would highly encourage you to go back and read it. Uh, so please don't leave, because uh, Hani is going to distribute this, this thing out over here. And you need to fill it out. And the next class, I'll continue with sampling and so on. So lecture notes are here until next Tuesday. And then I have one, I'll add some more to it, uh, put it up uh, probably sometime this week. Okay. Yes. Yes. One, one to one meaning, it, well, it maps from a distribution to a. Is it possible that two different functions have the same NGF? Two different distributions have the same NGF? No. Yeah, so given a distribution, it's a unique sort of fingerprint. So you cannot, you cannot have two different, yeah, so as long as the MGFs are there, you can say, okay, this is, yeah. That's why it's so powerful, because it's like a thing. All the moments, all the moments are, are, are matching, essentially. Yeah. It's the same as in transform, right? If Laplace transform of two, of two functions are the same, the functions are also the same. MGF is like that? It's like that. It's a transform. It's a e to the power something. Just like the Laplace is a transform, is a transform. Yes? It's uh, uh, it's not complex, okay. yeah. So yeah, but the characteristic function would be the levels. There are other transforms, the Mellon transform, the Z transform, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but this is kind of uh, what we need in statistics is just this. Any other question? Okay, so I'm done. But you.